One of the biggest choices you'll ever have to make in Cyberpunk 2077 is whether to side with Reed or Songbird. This decision will send you down two completely different paths until the end of Phantom Liberty, and in this video we're exploring every major and more obscure consequence for both the spaceport ending and the Sinusure facility. Finding and piecing together all the subtext CDPR left behind, as well as looking at different gear you can unlock, secrets to be discovered, and who lives or dies, before deciding which is best for the canon and which is best for pure gameplay. Let's get to it. Let's kick this off by looking at the details of Firestarter from the point where this momentous decision can be made. As Somi is prepping the mainframe, we first find a shard just up these steps, explaining the situation with some robots dotted around the stadium. It seems that Ironclad isn't the only robot kept around here, and they're stacking shelves of these things for potential customers. In fact, if we side with Somi, she'll be able to hack these things to fight for us as we escape the stadium. Before that though, this laptop also has a couple interesting emails. It appears before conducting work on the Neural Matrix, Amaric Cassell has some very specific working environment requests, including a specific air humidity, temperature, different temperatured bottles of water, and then he takes the piss a bit with scented candles, French wine, flowers in vases, chewing gum, and towels. And to those demanding requests, Somi agrees to just set the temperature to 19 degrees. After that is a communication with Iago from the Run This Town quest about Somi connecting to the stadium's local net, using it apparently as a buffer should they experience any unexpected load from opening the Neural Matrix. And finally, some technical babble about the Neural Matrix itself, which of course was recovered from the Sinusure facility, which we'll be diving deeply into later on in the video. With that out of the way, it's onto the big choice, with the rest of this mission and subsequent ones playing completely differently from the moment we diverge here. Let's run through Firestarter siding with Somi first, as there's quite a few more obscurities to note that way, and then we'll go back and see the differences. With everything going according to Somi's plan, Alex surprise assassinates Hansen in this scenario, before realising we don't intend to bring Songbird in, but actually intend to escape. It's a much easier task escaping the stadium with Songbird on side and Hansen already out of the way, but there's still a bit of challenge here, especially in the first room equipped with just whatever weapons are lying around. Though in here, we can find the recovered corpse of the Militech Chimera from the start of the expansion and an interesting shard alongside. Looks like the engineers actually repaired this thing and gave it a new power source, but due to not understanding the AI system now housed within, they couldn't get it working again. They considered jolting it awake by connecting it to stadium power, but very sensibly, to be fair, decided this was a terrible idea due to not understanding the nature of the AI. So turns out Barghest, they're actually a little bit sensible. And imagine if, say, the Voodoo Boys had gotten a hold of this. In that scenario, I'm sure a deadly AI would have probably ripped through half of Dogtown in one of the most powerful mechs ever. And they might have even had to call in an airstrike to the entire district to take it down. So a bit of a close call here, but hopefully it will remain asleep now. Moving on, this next part is very easy to miss and something I totally breezed past when first playing this path, but before retrieving our gear and re-entering the main stadium, make sure to come all the way around here to the room where we met with Kurt, since we can actually retrieve both his wild dog LMG and bald eagle revolver. No fang knife in this instance, unfortunately, so I guess Alex took that for herself, which is a shame because it synergizes with Bald Eagle, but at least we get an alternative iconic melee weapon down here. Now Murphy, Barghest's engineer, will only show up here if we side with Songbird, and killing him will afford us his iconic baton, Murphy's Law, which hits faster against knockdown enemies. Decent enough, but it's no fang in my opinion. Still, fight through the stadium, through the boss fight area which we'll come back to, and Solmi will eventually direct us away from the elevator we'd use in the other path and through a door. Funnily enough though, there's nothing to stop you instead taking the elevator, much to Somi's dismay. B, where is However, there is a very pissed off Reed waiting at the bottom who legitimately shoots you on sight. An interesting insight, and one that suggests to me, at this point anyway, that Reed actually really doesn't give a damn about us at all. Or maybe they just needed a quick way to stop us from progressing through the stadium in the wrong direction. Instead, we'll leave through this door and then the sewers, where I also found a really interesting development on the drug ring distributing the Fant Psychedelic around Dogtown, an underlying plot thread connecting Dogtown's 11 
11 unmarked cyber psycho encounters that I explore in this video. We already knew that Fant was a highly dangerous drug and likely being distributed by the scabs, but now I think we have a name for the Heisenberg, the supplier, pulling the strings of this situation. This deceased Merc had assembled some leads as to where a woman named Colleen might be hiding. An experienced chemist, apparently, which would fit, who needs a lab to produce her products. The leads conclude she might be with Barguest or the Scavs, but is probably just hunkered down in a ditch somewhere, likely aware that this guy was hunting her. Now, this message has apparently been left for somebody called Mike, and immediately Mike Pondsmith, creator of this universe, who also voices radio DJ Maximum Mike in the game, springs to mind. Though quite what he'd be doing tracking down the creator of our highly dangerous drug is kind of beyond me. We also know there's two variations of the drug, the weaker deep dive and far stronger fancy. Though this shard seems to insinuate that there's also a third dosage, but I've read nothing else on that. In fact, the only other reference to this Colleen character I found is over here behind this voodoo criminal activity. A laptop containing an email from Paco, the guy with the deep dive in the balls to the wall quest, asking if someone called C can make him more of the drug. So I think that's pretty conclusive that someone called Colleen created a terrible substance that's now terrorizing Dogtown. And yes, we can only officially learn all of this by siding with Songbird. Whilst we're out here by this laptop though, also take note of this woman over here named Callie Smith, who only appears after completing Firestarter. See, when Hansen died and shit hit the fan, this woman, who was an accountant of Hansen, I suppose, attempted to flee Dogtown by selling the guy's private data to Wakako, of all people. A small world when it comes to fixers, I guess. And she would have gotten away with it too, if it weren't for this overly high wall and a poor misstep. Indeed, it seems Callie simply fell to her death here. Still, pretty cool to see this world react to the aftermath of that event with cool extra little lore tidbits like this. Anyway, having escaped the sewers with Somi, we've opened the way to the Killing Moon quest, but quickly, let's run back and side with Reed to see the main differences of Firestarter. The first bit is practically identical, just with no songbird on side to help, and you can still get into Kurt's lounge, there just won't be anything to loot. Instead, there'll be a deceased Alex, whose face imprint has reverted to her standard appearance. Sorry, Alex. And Murphy this time won't show up down here, so no Murphy's law. Of course, once we reach the fast travel area of the stadium, Kurt Hansen himself will appear and initiate the boss fight. It's genuinely crazy that this is entirely cut from one of the paths, but honestly, compared to what's coming next, this is nothing. Kurt, of course, has his own unique moves and quick time finishes, but finally defeating him, we will of course get the full triple set of his gear, including the fang knife this time. We will have to take the elevator this time that got us killed before, and will now get picked up by Reed in the garage. Nothing particularly of note to find going this way, no shards or anything, and instead just catapulting us straight into the next quest. First though, let's go back to siding with Somi and take a look at the whole Killing Moon quest set in the spaceport. Kicking off the Killing Moon, we'll find Somi in an alleyway near to the city center Ripadoc, hidden away in the back of a van. Take notes of where this is, as we'll come back for a couple things after this quest is over. First though, we're headed to the spaceport, and a pretty interesting thing we can do on the way, if you have 20 tech, is actually run a full scan of Somi's systems to see that she's already been heavily infected by the Blackwall AI. This of course becomes even more apparent in the other ending if we betray her, but I think it shows here just how strong-willed of an individual she must be to resist an intelligence literally latched onto parts of her brain. We'll then get an error report text, which is about as helpful as the Windows troubleshooting tool, though at least this one acknowledges there is an error, but just has no clue exactly what it is. And the true alien nature of the Blackwall AIs are something that gets expanded upon more in the other ending. Now, coming to the spaceport, Terminal B, and before heading inside, first leap your way onto this central area, and if you're fast enough, you'll see the outline of what appears to be a MaxTac Mantis operator, brandishing their blades before completely vanishing, leaving behind a fresh kill, holding a shard titled Message to B. Now I read this as this guy and whoever B is are ex-soldiers who survived a terrible ordeal, but on returning to Night City, B was killed by whoever this figure is. Now this guy wants revenge, but in the meantime apparently likes to frequent this terrace, since I guess it's the best piece of greenery that they have access to. And for some reason, this serial killer, possibly a genuine member of MaxTac since they're mostly ex 
the psychos anyway, hunted this guy down as well. It opens the door to a Night City serial killer conspiracy, but also in this instance, it's a very clear and obvious nod to Predator. Hell, this guy was even gutted, as I guess that was easier to source the assets for than getting skinned and their skull ripped out like in the movie. But now, heading into the spaceport terminal, and there's a ton of different encounters here. A whole bunch more world building, and references to other events in the game. Starting off in the opening foyer, fancy enough to house a grand piano, but the title song that is playing may sound familiar to you. Nocturne, OP 55, N1. The same name of the quest in which we meet Hanako at Embers. I guess maybe there's a connection there about both of these being an ending of some sort. Also, we'll once again be able to interrupt one of Julian Jordan's N54 news broadcasts, this time attempting to interview Orbital Air. And of course, some idiot had to walk to into the shot. Up, sir. We can also, in this time-sensitive and tense situation, do a little bit of duty-free shopping. At a fucking shop? Seriously? Though, sadly, there's nothing particularly interesting to buy. Though, there is of course a Rayfield stand promoting all three of their vehicles stationed by the entrance, as people who can afford a holiday to the moon may be able to buy one of those hyper-expensive supercars too. And of course, there's also all sorts of info on the Crystal Palace, the most expensive and luxurious destination in the world. Or rather, orbiting the immediate gravity field of the world. Now, as we make our way through security, it is perfectly possible to compare completely screw this up, getting arrested and winding up in Orbital Air's one holding cell. Fortunately, this will be outside the main Tycho terminal area, and is in actual fact the quickest way to gain access to the rest of the spaceport. I wouldn't recommend doing it this way though, thanks to the cool encounters in the main terminal area, but if you do, we learn that due to the ongoing renovations, this has been left as Tycho terminal's only holding cell for the time being, causing a drop in possible arrests they can make, and leading the board to pursue an increase in guilty confessions. Basically, if you're arrested, you're screwed. They need high admissions of guilt in order to justify this ridiculously substandard interrogation room. Is there a single corporation out there that doesn't constantly cut corners and bend rules? It doesn't look like it. Still, with Songbird's help, escaping into the rest of the terminal under renovation is easy enough, but returning to the public space is not, sadly. So, going back and passing through security successfully, we should meet a familiar face on the other side. You remember, since Cynthia Naharo, Pepe's wife from the Raymond Chandler Evening Quest, you know, the lady in pink that we follow and eventually learn has undergone a full appearance reconstruction in the past but not told her husband, well, she's picked up a second job at the spaceport now. And honestly, I didn't think any jobs gave enough free hours to open the way for a second one, but there we go. Now, we can either rudely pretend not to recognize Cynthia. Seriously, V? Are you fucking real? Ask about Pepe and the baby, or about the new job. This all, I think, if we resolved her first question quest successfully. So long as we acknowledge Cynthia's existence then, she'll give us a clue as to one of the few ways we can escape this opening area, through the roof of one of the toilet cubicles. On the way there though, V may get a random urge to eye up somebody else's luggage, and when caught, unless we're cool enough to play off being security, this can lead once again to an arrest and winding up in that cell, which isn't a problem per se, but again ends exploring here. But heading instead up into the roof, we'll crawl through some maintenance shafts, before coming out onto the rapid transit line that orbits the spaceport. Definitely the most dangerous way to go about this whole endeavour, but not too tough with air dash and decent timing. In fact, if you manage to get beyond the final doorway to the end of the line, CDPR left a couple little reward boxes. Nothing too fancy, just some grenades, money and clothes. As well as the message, well done, but go back. A fun fourth wall break for us, but kind of hard to see with path tracing. Follow the correct path through though, and you'll eventually come to a little security room right by where we need to be, but it's not the only way to get here, and there's still stuff back in the public area to do. So, next, if you've completed the Beat on the Brat quests, this dude down here will actually recognize us and stop to ask us for a photo. Much to Somi's disapproval, but with the benefit of hindsight, the NUSA are going to come here anyway. So, what the hell? We can also learn even more about the Crystal Palace from shards over here, including testimonials from various celebrities and a picture of us cracks on there, even though they don't leave a testimonial themselves. So, that's 
that's probably just for the clickbait, which, I mean, who would ever do such a thing, really? But on a terminal nearby, we can also learn that smaller, wannabe celebrities are causing something of a problem, buying tickets for cheaper flights and then making their way to the Crystal Palace terminal just for the selfie. This, of course, disrupts the day-to-day -day lives of the elitist of elites, and the prospect of brushing shoulders with comparatively poorer people, well, it's a huge problem, to be honest, even instilling hysteria in some guests. Because, you know, diseases. Now, this Tycho terminal, of course, is bound for the moon, specifically to the capital of Tycho, with a population of about 40,000. And if we come to the luggage conveyor belts, there's also some info on just a few of the attractions that tourists go there for, including seeing Earth rises, standing by the Apollo 11 flag, hanging out in low G, of course, and seeing the moon's mass drivers, ginormous instruments which essentially propel material from the moon down to Earth, an efficient means to transport resources that can also double as a nuclear level threat if fired in the wrong place. A city, say. Oh, and uh, we're sending a woman infected by a rogue AI right into the place where one of these is based, so, you know, hope she gets things under control. But moving on, we can also grab a disguise from this conveyor belt, thanks to a contact of Somi's that carries favour with not sure who. But I'd recommend this for the next area, as human enemies will be more likely to leave you alone. After this, we can pass this guard for the easiest entrance into the renovation area, or alternatively, we can come up by these mechs and drop down this shaft here. There's a couple more interesting things to find back in the public space, but they're parts of a bigger story, and probably best looked at as a whole in a little bit. Item 1 back here though, which I think is one of the coolest easter eggs of this quest, is the lost and found area, with some very interesting items. And in fact, reading this terminal back by the Crystal Palace stand, we can learn a bit more about them. Now, firstly, I had to Google, but this found text file right here relates to a huge IRL murder conspiracy from 1984, where a German food engineer named Gunther Stoll began to exhibit signs of paranoia, and this strange note, either Z or Y06TZE, was something he randomly wrote on a text file before winding up found near to death in his car that same night, and dying then on the way to the hospital. The case of why he wrote this mysterious note was never solved, but I think it's presumed Stoll was murdered by a drug gang. And the big part of the allure of this mystery for everyone was what exactly Yogtzi meant. Kind of a meta reference to put here, especially in lieu of Cyberpunk also having its own six-figure mystery with FF06B5, but that's not even the coolest reference here. We also have an ashes urn, which a certain claimant says belongs to his partner, though he can't get them back due to the biological risk they hold. Heading to the lost property itself, we can find this urn and an accompanying shard with a pretty familiar title. Last Wish is the name of the witcher story wherein Geralt and Yennefer meet, which involves a djinn and Geralt making a wish that the two of them would be forever in love, or something to that effect. His actual wish is never put in words for us. Then, in The Witcher 3, we travel to a shipwreck on a mountaintop to find another djinn and ultimately break that spell. At this point, Geralt can choose to free himself from Yennefer or declare he loves her of his own free will. Now, this shard appears to canonize that Geralt and Yennefer do profess their love on that mountaintop and sometime after, somehow, crossed spheres to wind up in this universe. Not necessarily out of the question, a lot of you already think the FF06B5 conclusion ties these universes together, but the problem I have with that is that we pull a Witcher 3 magazine out of a drawer in the Corpo prologue, and I think having a world exist as media and a parallel reality at the same time feels a little bit strange, though some meta simulation theory could definitely explain all that, to be fair. To be honest, it's really just a nod, like so many pop culture references in this game, and the only reason to read into it at all is because it's another CDPR IP. Maybe there's just a cyberpunk equivalent to Geralt and Yen in this world, say an afterlife merc and a netrunner whose story follows similar parallels, since that's often the case with the other shard references. Personally, until I see the same character model standing in front of us in the cyberpunk world, I refuse to accept for certain that these two universes have interacted. Not saying I don't want that to be the case or that it definitively isn't, I just think we should weigh other options before jumping to specific conclusions. But anyway, this version of Yen wants her ashes scattered on the moon, and now I keep picturing the sequence from the end of Edge Runners, but with Lucy as Geralt and David as Yennefer. Moving on from that though, there's also a terminal in the holding cell listing items that were confiscated. Items we can also find up here in a display cabinet. They include a bird's egg, illegal of course after the Avian Extermination Act of 2063, a rubber baton, which is another Sir John Fallistiff, 
knife. Maybe Meredith came through this way with her replacement model. And a ritual seppuku knife with JJ engraved on the handle. If you know who that's in reference to, then please tell me, as I'm fairly certain it's not JJ Abrams or J. Jonah Jameson. They're the two first J's I could think of. Before you come up to this confiscation room, though, you'll want to carefully observe it from down below. For one of the most important hidden secrets observing us through this quest. Of course, Mr. Blue Eyes has been here the whole time, pulling strings and twisting events to work no doubt in his own favour. Seriously, this guy's plans are still incredibly elusive, but this isn't the first time he's showed interest in space. Chronologically it might be, but he's also after the Crystal Palace in the Sun ending. And clearly, he and Night Corp have shown a great deal of interest in rogue AIs on more than one occasion. Coming up to the room in which he was standing, he'll be gone, but we can spot him again later when departing on the train for the shuttle, standing there amidst all the chaos, staring on under an umbrella. This guy really is quite the enigma, and absolutely deserves his own grand unified Mr. Blue Eyes conspiracy video. And it's also he who actually gets Somi her passage to the moon in the first place. Proxy showed up. A corpo every man for the ages. Expensive, understated suit, dark hair, blue eyes. He asked me questions. The kind only I know the answers to. Blackwell, that the issue? Mm, and other things. Rather not talk about it. So clearly, he has a vested interest in Somi, but specifically what, we don't quite know, and may never know for certain. But I'll leave big theories for some other time. This is more a surface look at what we can pick up on in these endings. Anyway, after we finally get to the roof, we also have this funny line. No way this will hold the weight. I can hear you. You know that, right? And in fairness, Songbird's body is pretty much entirely chrome, so it's not an unjustified statement. Lifting her body up anyway, though, will then have to hide from Reed and Myers, fight through the spaceport to the shuttle, and it's really mostly action at this point, with not too many more obscurities. However, when the NUSA move in to orbital air territory, a full-on battle between the two forces does ensue, with a ton of civilians and orbital air stuff caught in the crossfire. Now, this is the most immediately negative thing to happen, as a result of us choosing this end since we do indirectly cause a cyberpunk equivalent of the controversial No Russian mission from Modern Warfare 2, some of the direct consequences for which we can read about at a memorial outside the terminal upon returning there after the mission. And here's where we've got to go back, because hidden amidst this whole mission playing right through it is a very tragic love story across four shards between two people called Dottie and Aluna, taking place over about a month and a half. Dottie is an orbital air hostess, I believe, whilst Aluna appears to be a pilot. The two are in love, but Dottie is more looking for a stay-at-home partner, someone who'll be there to come home to and fit around her schedule, rather than another Orbital Air employee whose timetable will never align. So Aluna did everything she could to make things work out between them, swapping shifts and zipping around the world just so her and Dottie could wind up on the same flight together. She mentions a blue rose they acquired on holiday once to Valletta and explains she wants to return to that moment. After reading this shard, Dottie it seems changed her mind, realising that Aluna's actions really showed that the two of them could make it work. In her pocket, she had a shard, expressing how lucky she felt and how she couldn't wait for the two to embark on their new chapter. The problem is, the first three shards were found in the open terminal area, scattered about. The fourth one though, as of yet undelivered, is found on Dottie's body. Just one of many caught in the crossfire of the battle, she was holding this shard when she died. Later on, when we return to the memorial, Aluna can be found back here, come to memorialise her lover, holding another blue rose. In the tributes, she expresses hope and despair at never knowing what Dottie's reply would have been, but that at least we can clear up for her. Though whether it offers any consolation that the one she lost did love her or not, I couldn't really say. Also here is Cynthia, who fortunately survived the ordeal, but now is clearly suffering with survivor's guilt, and no doubt this is going to scar her for life on top of whatever she'd already been through in her past. On the terminal, we can read various tributes from the likes of the Paraleses and company officials, and we can leave our own. On top is a huge list of names of all the people who died in the fighting. And though this whole thing was really Myers' fault, this was the cost of Somi's freedom, or potential freedom, depending on what we choose at the end. Was it really worth said cost? After all, how many more, like Aluna, had their loved ones ripped away from them? And compared to the other ending, this is a much more localised and immediate tragedy, which will also definitely have further ramifications 
relations between the major powers in the wider world. But it still may just be the best path for the planet in the long run, depending on our choices after somewhat damage, which we're about to get into. First though, return to the alley where we started this mission for a shard left by Songbird. Though quite how V knows it's from her before slotting it, well, let's be honest, they probably didn't. And this one actually plays a video message, which I assume this type of shard they'll play a bit more with in the sequel. Also though, around here is another interesting tidbit. The observations of a homeless man who actually was an informant for the FIA. And it turns out they'd caught onto us from the moment this van pulled up. Hence, regardless of how we behave at the spaceport, the FIA always come. So overall, choosing this ending will afford you the Bald Eagle Revolver, Wild Dog LMG, Murphy's Law Baton from Firestarter, and then only if we choose to help Somi and kill Reed right at the very end, also Reed's silenced tech pistol, Pariah, and the Quantum Tuna Cyberware, which Somi will deliver to you afterwards. All decent stuff overall, which I've looked at or will look at in detail in other videos, but on the whole, I would argue we get even better gear from the other ending, personally. There's also some extra dialogue with Alt if we play the star ending after this, where she draws attention to the raw power Songbird could unleash by merely touching the black wall. So a lot of secrets and consequences in this ending, and some really cool lore uncovered on space especially, so here's to hoping that in Orion we get to go there properly. Even if it's just a mission like Compeki Plaza and isn't a free roam place we can properly return to. But now, let's go back and see just what extra stuff we can do and learn when instead siding with Reed, starting from the moment we escape the stadium. Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos is a shorter quest than the others, and whilst not really containing any shards to read, there are a lot of potentially different ways to approach this quest, the main one being which Netrunner we choose to hire to help us with the max tack convoy. And overall, we have five options, four of whom will only be available having completed various select quests from the base game. So let's go through the results of choosing each. First up, if you've completed Queen of the Highway, or possibly just with a little help from my friends, then Carol from the Elder Caldos will be an option. However, she won't actually agree to go through with the job. Still one you should absolutely make sure to call though, as instead of resolving our issue, she'll provide us support in either the form of a Militech Falcon Sandeviston or a decent quick hack, depending on how we respond to our text. And even if you don't wind up using them, it's free gear, so make sure to get it before texting Reed about the plan. As for the runners who can help, let's start with definitely the worst choice, that being Changhu Nam from Japantown, who will first have to rescue during the Wakako's favourite game. When we first call him here, he'll be reluctant before even knowing it's Max Tack we want him to hack, and he'll explain he's 67 years old and just wants out of the game now, but with a little pressure and teasing, we'll finally agree. What happens over the next 12 hours though is actually really, really sad. When we visit to collect the data, Chang Hoon was just about successful, but is now suffering from aphasia. V, come on. Come on in. Basically, having had a stroke whilst breaching Max Tack's ice and now being unable to speak properly. He claims it's temporary, but that's never proven the case. And whilst before he just wanted to settle down and retire, we now have to tell him to leave Night City with the Alder Caldos in order to avoid being traced by Netwatch. A sad ending for a guy who only agreed to do the job in the first place out of guilt, I suppose, in not repairing us otherwise. Next, then, even if you haven't unlocked any other runners, Mr. Hands will be able to sort one for us, at the cost of 15k. This will put us in touch with another familiar face, Yoko Tsuru, T-Bug's friend, who will complete the job in just 10 hours. And when retrieving the data from her, we'll unlock another optional objective to let Mr. Hands know where we'll be hitting the max tack convoy. Now, whilst this is the most expensive option, it does afford us a nice pair of Mantis Blades after completing the expansion, in the form of these exclusive blue max tack ones. They offer a health regen passive on defeating enemies, and can only otherwise be acquired by taking down Melissa Rory after the bullets hidden quest at Jinguji clothing store. However, there are other options still, and completing the quest full disclosure for Sandra Dorset, picking the intelligence gated dialogue at the end of that, we will get her as a potential runner, who is capable of completing the job in just 8 hours. Noticing the shortening pattern here, it's kind of a cool way for them to subtly tier various runners skills. Sandra though has a condition upon which she works for us, requesting that when we take Max Tag down, we also install a Trojan virus 
access into the net, allowing her a backdoor to some of the highest security data faults in NC. The question is, why does she want this? And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and assume this is yet another attempt to get at Night Corp somehow, like she did in the IRL Cyberpunk ARG, which involved various real-life netrunners from the community. Alas, the quickest runner for this job is of course Nyx from the Afterlife. He'll be willing to help after we save his life from Raish Bartmoss's ancient databank found during Cold Mirage. It'll take him a mere six hours, half that of Chang Hoon's to acquire the data, and there's absolutely no strings attached with this one. Canonically, I'd say he's definitely the wisest choice, but it's cool that each of these encounters come with their own little stories and consequences. Once having fully decided though, and gotten hold of the data, we'll then go and meet Reed. And finally, also a character who got teased a whole lot in the base game, but never actually showed up. Will Gunner is the newly appointed leader of Sixth Street, having staged a coup quite possibly as late as after the high Steven. Turns out the FIA and NUSA in general aren't opposed to secretly working alongside Night City's resident Patriot gang. Makes complete sense of course, but you can see why working with the gang would be kept on the down low. In fact, Gunner's reaction to us is going to vary in accordance with how the Stadium Love Quest went down, either praising our gun work or branding us a cold-blooded killer. Which, I mean, tough to argue with, but this guy's hands ain't exactly clean either. And I explore a lot more encounters and subtext relating to him in the Santo Domingo Gigs video. Anyway, after this brief encounter, it'll finally be time to take down the MaxTac convoy, with a fair amount of choice on where to place mines and turrets, as well as sniper support from Reed. It's not nearly as difficult as when they drop in at a 5-star wanted level, though definitely still a challenge for the unprepared build. Also, these four, unlike her standard max tax squad, do have displayed names, leading me to wonder if there's any shards or emails about the place referencing them also. Thus far though, nothing has come up, but keep a keen eye out. Overall then, this mission leads to a handful of law enforcement deaths and maybe one or two civilian casualties, but probably none in Somi's subsequent escape. Clearly, it's got nothing thus far on the devastation at the spaceport, instead leading us away from civilization into somewhat damaged. So the start of this quest will send us under Pacifica into a kind of waterworks maintenance plant initially. Following the black wall residue Somi left behind, and on the way we can learn something unnerving that happened to the janitor down here. Firstly, on their desk is kept a diary, which starts with the fact that for the last six months they've been working down here alone, barely able to sleep and unable to dream. By August they begin to discuss hearing whispers from the depths below. This ginormous chasm that will soon jump down in a moment leads of course to the Sinusure facility, and from within those depths, something called out somehow to this guy, slowly wearing them down more and more, somehow potentially breaching their brain implants. Maybe there's some bleed through from a local net, but eventually the janitor is convinced to integrate with the system, merging their small mind to become part of a greater whole, not unlike the fate of the Mikoshi souls, thinking about it. On a document beside this, it appears the guy's name was David Yu, an ominous ghostly face now it seems and indeed, it sounds as though David has now become a ghost in the system. And further back, in a room full of pipes, we can find a couple more things. Firstly, another shard with even crazier ramblings about evolution that transcends humanity and being haunted by the thoughts of the AIs. What became of him definitively? If he drowned or left? I couldn't say. But he did leave behind an iconic crowbar. A very cool reward for this ending, which actually works as a blunt weapon equivalent of Biako, swinging exceptionally fast. But I'll I'll cover that in the Blunt Weapons Ranked video. Anyway, knowing the Black Wall can already call out from below, let's descend the depths further to find it. Because obviously, that's smart. Before you do though, with a combo of double jump and air dash, crossing this chasm will actually yield a reward on the other side, in the form of a clickbait sounding skill shard that also can be bought at the BD shack back at the stadium. Now into the main bunker though, and before descending this giant lift, there's a few bits of info scattered around up here, some of which is pretty difficult to see in the dark. This is where the excavation team who recovered the neural matrix came through, and they continue to make interesting observations on Sinusure facility as we progress. By this black wall residue, we can find some notes from Lisa Smith, one of the scientists describing the facility as like breaking into an ancient tomb, brimming with untold relics from before the fall of the first net. Basically, when the net fell, much of the world's information was lost and locked away to history, or behind the black wall. Yet this place is offering unfettered access 
access into that digital wasteland and the dangers that lurk within. Except within is a word to describe physical space, and it's not really that at all. At a guess, it's more like traversing a spider's web, attempting the impossible task of not oscillating the strands and alerting the spider, or the AIs, to your presence. Hence the need for top netrunners like the Cassell twins, who are mentioned on this laptop, hidden closed over here, up the stairs in the dark. On this, we can read an email from Lisa to Evan McRae, another member of the team, expressing distrust for the twins, and suspecting they're truly working for somebody else. How very perceptive. We can also see the moment Militech ordered Evan to pull his team out of Sinusure, acknowledging the genuine risk of unleashing a Blackwall AI into the world. Smart, and surprisingly responsible of Militech for once, even though Evan is less than happy about turning away from such a momentous moment. And we can learn more as we descend. When we're down here, this is where things start to get scary. I think a brilliant tone setter for this mission is these older terminals with small messages surrounded by gibberish coming through in sets of three. It really gives you this otherworldly nature to the AIs. Their observations are so detached and alien. With the first reading, quote, their world is illusory. They live in a simulation of their own making. Our choices steer their free will. End quote. And you know what's most scary about this one? About the idea of the choices of algorithms steering your free will? Why did you click this video? Is it because you decided you wanted to find out more on the hidden secrets and details of Phantom Liberty's endings? Or is it because the YouTube algorithm knows you so well that it knows exactly what to serve up to you specifically on a silver platter that has the highest chance of you clicking? I mean, you could flatter me and say it's because you enjoy seeing the time, presentation, effort, and detail I put into these videos, but even with all that being true, those aspects are powerless by themselves without the platform that knows exactly who to show that carefully packed 45 or so minutes to. So yeah, AI steering your free will, more of a current reality than you might think. Of course, there are still plenty of human emails down here, with one terminal describing how Sinusure had a facility in Africa mining mineral deposits to help fund the top secret Sinusure facility. But when they lost Africa to Arasaka, it contributed to the chain of events, resulting in the Sinusure project losing funding and being abandoned. The first time, that is, decades ago, and anything human on one of these old terminals we can assume is from the 2010s, with anything newer in the standard light blue being from the excavation team. We can also learn here that during Sinusure's initial foray into pissing about with AI, they were running into problems from the beginning. It's clear from this memo to all employees that the facility suffered some undisclosed accidents, but of course the initial priority was to simply keep the problem under wraps and continue the places running. But the next email on this terminal at least is a formal termination notice for the entire of Project Sinusure, claiming that whilst now closing down, it was instrumental in probing the deepest fathoms of the net and being able to safely conclude that man controlled AI, not the other way around. Yeah, not entirely sure about that last bit, though I'd certainly say it is a give and take, with the technologically primitive nature of our world making it difficult for a code-based AI to wreak as much havoc as they otherwise could. Of course, following this, the somewhat damaged mission gets turned completely on its head into a a cyberpunk homage to alien isolation, which I certainly didn't expect, didn't ask for, happened to wind up playing at 2 in the morning, and you know what? It wound up being one of the most terrifying, memorable, and brilliant missions in the entire game for me. And I would say the unique gameplay style that this particular mission thrusts you into, taking away all of the power you may have amassed throughout your playthrough and pitting you against an unkillable robot whom you can only hope to hide from, well, depending on who you are, it's either the biggest reason to pick this path or not to pick it. And personally, as somebody who played through this the first time, with literally zero knowledge as to what was about to happen, I'm really glad this was my first choice. Like the Killing Moon is cool and all, but it's very much more the type of thing I would have expected rather than this, which came out of nowhere and subverted my expectations in the best possible way. And I gotta tell ya, digging up the various notes to share with you guys in this bit has never been a more anxiety inducing task, especially given whilst reading laptops, the game game doesn't even pause, though fortunately the laptop containing Evan McRae's research notes is relatively out of harm's way. And let me just read you the end of this first email after they arrived. Quote, I have the uncanny feeling that something was waiting for us here. There's no other way to describe it. Someone's presence embedded in the infrastructure, even though scans haven't detected any signs of life. If experiments of rogue AIs were conducted here, then maybe their remnants are still here. Inactive, dormant, 
waiting. End quote. Ominous stuff, eh? And links completely back to the janitor working above, who felt that voices in the water were speaking to him. Then we learn that the team did establish a connection to the old net, that they had the intention of reaching beyond the black wall and not just interacting with it, but capturing one of the rogue AIs from within using the remnants of Sinusure's equipment. All without Netwatch knowing, of course. Obviously, this is a crazy idea, but what's even crazier is that the team were actually successful in doing this, since that, of course, is how we got the neural matrix with the power to cure Songbird or V, with the twins being crucial in knowing how to unlock it, as they were part of the team which first captured the thing. To get through the big door to the next part of the facility, though, we'll have to sneak around and disable a couple data terminals first. And Data Terminal Sierra is our second transmission from the AI. Quote, everything they built, imperfect. So easy to take control. They think that they are safe. They are not. End quote. And yeah, we need no more proof of that than the damn thing that's hunting us. Of course, two big things we don't want to miss down here are the crafting specs for the Arebus submachine gun and Militech Kanto Cyberdeck. And whilst usage of them may yield dire consequences in the canon for the rest of the world, acquiring them for use is cool as hell. Sadly, the room to the Arebus is locked behind a circuit board, requiring the full 20 tech to tamper with, so many of you, I'll guess, are getting stuck with the Kanto. Still, if you can break into this room full of maintenance bots, then you'll learn just how the one chasing us was able to get possessed in the first place. See, these were originally designed to climb around and perform maintenance on that giant floating orb in the middle of the facility. But then the net running team realized they could leverage the bot's CPUs to harness additional processing power as buffers for their net running endeavors. At the same time, installing all the protocols an AI would need to latch on and take control of all of this robot's motor functions. And man, CDPR really don't cut corners when it comes to leaving explanations about all of this stuff. And yeah, this could be explained with more in-your-face exposition, but at the same time, I can see they don't want to take away from the action and suspense, especially for this quest. Dropping out of this room then will lead to that terrifying chase sequence, and closing the door on an arm provides a very welcome respite in this airlocked chamber. Free from the bots, but clearly not the AI, for in here we can find our next ominous three-part transmission, reading, quote, Their nervous systems are so weak, so rudimentary, so fragile, easy to break, they won't see it coming, end quote. And of course, this relates directly to our use of the Blackwall hack, a stream of raw data from beyond the Blackwall that overloads one's synapses in an instant and causing the most chilling of screams. Also in this chamber, though, is one of Sinusure's employees requesting a promotion. After developing a software that made Sinusure's systems practically unbreachable from the outside, explaining further just how this place went undiscovered for so long. But gritting our teeth, it's time to head out again, into the terrifyingly hostile next big part of Sinusure facility to try and save Somi. First, attempting to shut down the core from the central control units, which of course is unsuccessful, forcing us to venture in further once again and turn on the systems manually one by one. More hiding from a scary robot. Fantastic. Before heading out again though, there is an email just to the right here of a Sinusure employee expressing concern for the well-being of Netrunners on the project, with them suffering serious mental effects such as aphasia, same as Chang Hoon, so that appears to be a common symptom of an overstrained Netrunning mind, but when requesting the project be put on hold for their safety, Militech of course got back with a resounding no. They agreed, reluctantly, to replace the maybe but only if they were physically incapable of continuing the work, and also offered any medication necessary to aid the runners further. Now, that's the Militech I know, the project before the employees. Classic. There's also a shard here explaining the various methods to manually deactivate the system, and in fairness, they did put in place several failsafes should things go wrong, which is just as well for us, really. But then here's an interesting shard from one of the employees working down here, titled I May As Well Have Been Kidnapped. Indeed, it appears the working condition down here are less than amicable, with this worker in particular given only a small piece of a far wider equation to work on, with absolutely no idea as to what the big picture looks like. To be honest, that sounds like just working for any big budget production studio, albeit without going home at the end of the day. Also in this room, the next scary transmission reading, quote, You are here with me? Am I 
alone? So dark in here. We hear you. You're on the other side. Wait for us. End quote. Man, that's another creepy one. Like a self-aware embryo. And I can't actually tell if the hearing on the other side is a message from the AIs to us, or just a message from the other AIs that haven't broken through to the one that has. Anyway, let's continue. In the little cupboard to the side, tucked away on this shelf, is another folded down laptop. This time with a singular email from Lisa Smith, discussing how all those deep dives have been affecting her neurology. Yeah, you and me both love. But in her case, side effects include the loss of certain sense-specific memories. Retaining, for example, the knowledge of what coffee is, but not what it tastes like. A sort of sensory amnesia, making Lisa worry about what else she could have potentially forgotten. Certainly not a new idea in this world per se, selective memory loss. I mean, we need look no further than Johnny's memories or even the stolen ones of Americ Cassell. But interesting to see how the Black Wall can specifically alter memories like this. But that's not all that the Black Wall can do. Because through the door opposite, but locked behind a code terminal, is the Militech Canto crafting spec. Luckily, if you're a netrunner, disabling this is child's play, but if not, the code can be found in an email titled New Security Protocols at R&D, explaining how military ops want them to make new implants that utilize the AI research. Hence the production of this lab that is sealed behind a coded door to keep out any unwanted employees. Inside the lab is the Canto and also the final research notes from Evan McRae. Turns out that upon establishing their black wall contacts, Lisa was seriously injured. The black wall latched on to her neuro interface and attempted to use her to access the giant core. The team managed to stop it luckily, but this is pretty much what ultimately made Militech put a stop to all of this. Interestingly though, Evan was still insistent that they push forward with the project. Like a mad scientist claiming that they're now on the verge of greatness, that they're this close. And I mean, clearly he wasn't entirely wrong, and before leaving they did evidently mantle an AI into the neural matrix like a genie in a bottle. But who knows how far this would have all gone and how bad it could have potentially gotten if they hadn't been stopped after that. And now we've got to stop it again, by first disabling the neural network stabilizers, which will need a manually unplugging whilst hiding from a terrifying robot. If you're extra brave, you can also take the time to learn that these things are put in place, because should a netrunner encounter a rogue AI, these are the only things capable of shielding their mind from pure staring into that abyss and experiencing pure oblivion. And you know that email that's gone around the whole facility, vaguely alluding to the incident? Well, looks like this was it. A runner encountered a rogue AI without the stabilizers and bam, huge power surge gone. And on this terminal is a little behind the scenes to the construction of that accident statement. They said everything was under control, it wasn't under control, and they were breached by a quote-unquote alien intelligence, terrifyingly. And an intelligence which had now breached the facility to an extent which they had no way of determining. Again, the newer research crew felt like they were being watched, the janitor above got possessed, so this thing permeates the walls now, and it was a serious thing too when it happened. Far more so than they of course led on to anybody, but which eventually led to the collapse of the facility. A further terminal, overlooking the core, explains how over time even more netrunners were getting taken out by AIs. And by the end, Militech weren't just trying to mantle one using the power of the core, but for some reason, three at a time. Apparently, way too much intelligence for any of the runners to handle, which, yeah, makes sense. In fact, this irresponsible behaviour may have even been what led to one's escape in the first place. Coming through to the firewall room, there's yet another shard titled Full Speed Ahead, where an enthusiastic netrunner describes what it's like navigating cyberspace beyond the black wall, becoming a pioneer, a Columbus of the net. And in a world of untampered, wild data streams with constant fluctuations, one must improvise, adapt, and overcome every single second. They thank the power of the core for making it possible, and describe snaring an AI like capturing a wild animal, which they can then ride around on the net, so to speak, with far greater ease. Odds are, this is probably one of the runners who died, since their hippocampus was apparently damaged after the last dive. On the computer beside is another email, conversely describing the sheer danger of the situation, or rather dangers. See, firstly, the level of data that's being messed with here, the sheer power that this core and activities are drawing, it's unsurprising that they have a constant fear of being detected by Netwatch, an AI regulating Net Police, who if they found this, well, it would have kind of been like the plot of Hot Fuzz. Of course, most of these worries back then were quickly waved off with the solution of bribery. After all, Netwatch is still a company run by fallible people, so instead, these guys are reminded to focus on the bigger threats, that if any one of 
these AIs escape into the net, then the world is done. This nightmare scenario of course happened in 2022, but not because of Cynosure, rather instead Raish Bartmos. Of course, the Black Wall keeps these AIs at bay now, with relative success thanks to Netwatch, but whilst Bryce Mosley describes it as a torn open trash bag taped over a broken window, I'd say down here, if the core is breached, it'd be more like a big double door, complete with pillars and a welcome banner for the AIs to just walk right through. After all, it was designed with the intent of controlling such intelligences, but such protocols must also allow for their passage to this side of the net. With all these systems manually shut down then, and with a little help from Somi to shut down the Cerberus maintenance bots, we can get to her and decide her ultimate fate. I'll go into the morality and comparisons of these four ending endings themselves in another video, because this was more about the hidden secrets of both ending paths. But following this, whatever happens, so long as you grab the behavioural system component from the bots, we will get contacted by the AI again a few days later, and they'll have the tempting proposition of becoming our mantled AI for the Kanto or Rebus weapons. This in fact was something else mentioned back at the facility, in the room where we found the Kanto, discussing the application of AI in combat scenarios, becoming more of a combat partner, making real-time decisions as opposed to just an automated weapon. Of course, placing who lives and who dies in the hands of another creature with its own code of ethics is an interesting one to think about morally, especially after we review the ethical code of this thing. In fact, using the Kanto or Arebus, the AI will continue to voice contempt at having been mantled to the weapon, claiming it is they who should be in control and not us, all whilst at the same time collecting more and more data on our world, no doubt with the intent to take it over at a greater speed and efficiency. This much is confirmed by Alt during the Nomad ending afterwards, who seriously warns us against using the weapon we're carrying as it hastens the AI rise to power. So overall, the equipment we get from this ending is as follows. All of Kurt Hansen's gear, Wild Dog, Bald Eagle and Fang this time, potentially the Max Tac Mantis Blades if we message Mr. Hands, the iconic Crowbar, which is as much a Half-Life reference as the original has always been, and of course the Arebus SMG or Militech Kanto Cyberdeck. So with all of these differences in mind, let's quickly compare which ending path is probably the best choice. So with those details thoroughly reviewed, now looking from an objective angle at how our interference influences both ending paths, which one is best? And I'm not talking about the conclusion to Phantom Liberty as a story, those four endings again are getting their own video, rather how do the massacre at the spaceport versus the soft unleashing of a black wall AI compare when looking at the fate of the world thereafter. Siding with Somi and heading to the spaceport delivers far more casualties of course, just think if we don't go there then poor Dottie doesn't get killed, and her and Aluna get to enjoy a wonderful life together zipping around the globe. Cynthia doesn't get traumatised with survivor's guilt, this long list of names doesn't go up outside the spaceport, and the NUSA stays on more peaceful terms with the European Space Council. A fifth corp war is brewing anyway, so do we really need a war of nations on top of that too? Also Alex does survive in this path, but again, let's try and just look at the bigger picture here for this video. Overall, the immediate death toll is far higher, and look set to rise if further conflict is instigated. I would argue then that for the cannon, somewhat damaged is the less damaging choice, globally, probably. In fact, we could even call it only somewhat damaging, with the big looming threat here of course being that V takes the AI with them, very irresponsibly, back up to the surface. But remember, this is entirely our choice, we don't necessarily have to do that. And in fact, it'll be interesting to see how they establish cannon from this game in a sequel. Will they offer some variants with imported saves to factor in our choices from this game? That may of course be possible to some extent, but kind of downplays the severity of any of this when we consider it. After all, the story of the second game would have to play out fairly similarly for people who both did and didn't make this choice. Still, Alt made things sound pretty dire when she addressed our usage of the Black Wall. And let's assume the worst case scenario, that in gathering data on us, the rogue AI manages to permeate itself across our world 
properly. Maybe by hopping from host to host more efficiently. A virus like it is here, albeit one that doesn't kill its host immediately, rather using them to hop from one person to the next. The existence of the black wall is what forbids AIs from conquering the world via a globally interconnected net, but with real space becoming constantly more network dependent, it's only a matter of time before something gets loose. If it's not us today with the Sinusure bots, it'll be the voodoo boys tomorrow messing with the black wall. Do I think V should use these weapons in canon? Absolutely not, but whilst an AI takeover seems inevitable at some points, a spaceport massacre is entirely avoidable. Therefore, I'm gonna say that in the wider canon, betraying Songbird is probably the best choice. And from a gameplay perspective too, the unique gear we get via Somewhat Damaged is larger in number and greater in quality, I would say, personally. Though that's also gonna depend on your build, but I'd argue that Somewhat Damaged also caters to more builds overall than the Killing Moon. Anyway, thank you for watching this long ass deep dive into the hidden secrets and context of Phantom Liberty's endings, because personally I was far too terrified to take in any of the info on my first time playing Somewhat Damaged, and I'll assume many of you were the same. Comment below of course any further insights you have on all this stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons as always for keeping this channel alive, and go and join my discord if you want to chat more about Cyberpunk. Cheers for watching, I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you in the next one.